back here. Um, so uh, I wanted to talk about a project. It's an ongoing project, but I'll tell you kind of what we, uh, what we know so far. Um, but let me take you back a little bit and review something that, especially in this room, has been talked about way too much. But let me review it one more time and bore the experts for a few minutes. So um, there's this thing called Apollonian circle packing. So there's Apollonius, about 200 BC. And the basic problem is a, there's a special case of the general problem that he wanted to solve, which is given three circles, in this case uh, mutually tangent, how do you construct um, two further circles that are tangent to the given ones? Okay? And um, if you get bored and you don't want to listen to anything I say, you can work on this problem. Um, it's, uh, it is high school geometry, but it's rather advanced high school geometry, so try it out. Um, in fact, uh, so we know that Apollonius proved this, but the books in which he proved this were lost. So we didn't know how he did it. And uh, for about a thousand years, people thought you, you actually can't do this for straight edge and compass. And there was some mistake in Apollonius. But then Viet finally gave a proof that um, uses only tools available to Apollonius and straight edge and compass. So we, we do think he, he knew how to do it. Actually. Um, Arthur Baragar, Arthur Baragar and I wrote a, a paper recently that you can do this with seven elementary moves so of the straight edge and compass. If, if you care, I can show you at the end. But anyway, so that's um, the Apollonian problem. And uh, Leibniz, who re many people re uh, return to this problem over and over, and Leibniz said, well, he's studying you know, iter iterating things and, and limits and so on. So he said, once you do this once, you have these other three uh, collection of three tangent circles, so you can do it again, and you can do it in every one of these interstices, and you can do this forever, and you get what's now known as an Apollonian circle packing. And um, right, so you might wonder how many circles are there with radius at least uh, one over a thousand or one over a million. How many will you draw if you if you're trying to get some uh, understanding about this? And uh, there's an old paper of uh, O and myself that gives you an asymptotic formula, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, an even more uh, kind of surprising thing, and what's maybe most surprising, it was a mist by everybody until Frederick Soddy observed that um, if you look at the bend, so the bend of a, of a sphere in general will be one over the radius. Uh, in the case of circles, that's just the curvature. In higher dimensions, uh, we'll just call it bend. If you look at the bends, well, if the initial configuration um, so here's a circle with radius 1 over 18. Here's a circle with radius 1 over 23. The outermost circle has radius a tenth, but we'll give it the opposite orientation so that the interiors are disjoint. So I'll call that a negative bend. Um, Saudi observed that when you do this straight edge and compass construction, the next circles will have radius 1 over 27 and 1 over 35. So it's drawing one of the numbers here are the bends. And you do this again, you get integers, and you do this again, and forever you'll get integers. Okay, so this is kind of this beautiful uh, integral Apollonian circle packing story that um, was missed before 70 years ago, 80 years ago. Okay, so um, once you see these integers, and I'm a number theorist, so you start asking uh, all kinds of questions. For some reason, these questions were also missed until uh, 15 years ago. Uh, and the most basic one is what numbers are we seeing? So this was asked in a series of papers uh, by Graham, Legarios, Mallows, Wilkes, and Yan. And um, so if we let b be the set of bends, the set of integers that, that we see here, so we see negative 10, we see 18, 23, 35, 27, 62, 63, 78, 83, and so on. So what are these numbers? And uh, after not so much playing around, you will observe, as they did, and this was explained in Elena Fuchs's thesis, you'll only see certain residue classes mod 24. Okay, and these are the residue classes in this particular case. And um, so we'll call, so that's a local obstruction to an integer appearing. So we'll call an integer admissible if it relies in one of these residue classes mod 24. Okay. And then the conjecture, which is kind of from naive counting that this is what should happen, is that, uh, every sufficiently large admissible integer should arise. So in other words, uh, if you look at 24,023, hopefully that's big enough, somewhere way in here should be a circle whose bend is 24,023 because it satisfies the right local condition. 
So these local conditions should be everything. Okay, is, is that clear? By the way, please interrupt at any time. I really, I, I'm trying to make this uh, very, very elementary, so uh, everything should be very understandable. This choice of 18 and 23 is, you can, you can make other choices, right? You can make lots of other choices, infinitely many other choices. The classes will always be mod 24, and there's only a finite list of rules like this that can arise, coming from strong approximation or failure of strong approximation for some thin group, but I, I won't say more than that. It's a theorem. So it was experimental here and a theorem here, and it's not difficult. It's, there's a certain group that's governing this, and it's a Zariski dense uh, subgroup of a semi simple algebraic group. And so you have strong approximation, which tells you eventually it will be the full orthogonal, this is uh, the Zariski closure sum orthogonal group. Eventually, mod, the mod Q reductions will be the full orthogonal groups, but for primes two and three, they're not. And so that's where 24 is coming from. Another question? Lots of numbers are repeating. Lots of numbers are repeating. Can I find at least one example to demonstrate that? Yeah, 135 and 135. So, so um, yeah, so I, I glossed over the theorem with uh, Heo, but what it says is that the, the number of circles, so curvature bends counted with multiplicity, is uh, up to x is x to some exponent 1.3 something, which is, which is related to the Hausdorff dimension of this fractal. So if the integers with multiplicity is up to x, is x to the 1.3, then each number should be hit x to the 0.3 times. That's, that's what I mean by some naive, uh, you know, these are all, the only local obstructions we know, and so hopefully this is everything. Other questions? This is great. Keep, keep me honest. OK. Um, and so uh, uh, John Bergan and I proved uh, a couple of years ago that this conjecture is true in density. So if you take the ratio of the bends which you see up to x compared to the ones that you should be seeing up to x asymptotically, that's one. Um, and this builds on already some initial uh, work in this paper and then a letter of Sarnax to Ligarius and then Fuchs. And Bergan Fuchs showed that this uh, has positive uh, limit. So that was the positive density conjecture. OK, and I'm not going to say anything more about this, but if you're interested, there's a uh, survey paper in the bulletin from A to Z. This has something else to do with something called Zarimba's conjecture. But this is all kind of old stuff, and I don't want to bore the people that have heard this a million times. So any questions before we move on a little bit? Why 24? 24 is because uh, this group that I'm not going to say too much about, it's, it, it's a thin group. Meaning it's um, in the real points of its Zariski closure, it has infinite index. So it's, um, you know, you can't say what, what the elements of the group look like. But when you reduce mod p, what strong approximation tells you is that it will look like the ambient group mod p. Except that, except for some small number of primes and prime powers. And the small number of primes are the primes 2 and 3. And for 3, it stabilizes immediately. And for 2, you have to go to 2 to the 3rd. And then it stabilizes. So that so two to the third times three is twenty-four. Yeah. So that group is universal, but what the residue class is depends on your initial configuration. But there's only a finite number of initial configurations, mod twenty-four. Okay? Any other questions? Okay, so there's this nice picture, and this is kind of I, I thought this was the, the end of it. We have reason to believe that proving the full conjecture is very difficult because if you change the problem slightly, we can make counterexamples. Uh, we do believe that this uh, doesn't have those counterexamples. But um, that's kind of where things were. And um, then, so what I've been thinking about is a joint with my postdoc, Kei Nakamura, at Rutgers. And we started thinking about, why is this happening? So why this is a vague question, but it, are there other things like it? So why does this integer, integral structure exist? If you can give an easy proof of this integrality using Descartes' Circle theorem, but maybe there's some more fundamental or uh, intrinsic explanation. Are there more like it? If so, how many more? Can we classify them? So what was known, uh, in fact, Saudi had already observed the sphere packing, uh, the analog of the Apollonian circle packing you can do in three dimensions. And it will again have this integrality. And um, Boyd had observed in the 70s um, 
although he didn't stu he studied it from the point of view of a circle packing, but not the integral properties. The integral properties were studied by Gittler Mallows. Um, instead of putting, so here are three initial circles. <laughs> instead of putting a single circle here, I can put three circles in a conformally rigid way. And then if you keep doing this, you get another packing, which again is always integral. And uh, this was generalized by Diaz and Nakamura to <coughs> putting three spheres in every hole where there's a hole that can fit spheres. And this again, you can do it. And there were maybe two other examples that were known of these sphere packings with, with integrality. And so we wanted to really understand what's going on. Um, I, I hope to convince you that we are at least on the right track, because here are two answers of what's going on. The first answer is um, there are infinitely many such integral packings. And uh, the second answer is that there are finitely many such integral packings. OK, so, so we really understand what's going on. So let me explain uh, what I mean by this. All right, the first thing is we have to define terms. Uh, I can't just say it has to look like these pictures. What's really going on? So first of all, what are we going to say is a packing? So an SN minus 1 packing of Euclidean space with a point at infinity will be a, an infinite collection of spheres with an orientation so that I can say we need the orientation to say we want the interiors to be disjoint. So we're allowed to have you know, one sphere whose interior is, is its exterior, like that negative bend. And we want it to be a packing, so it should fill up all of space. So the union of the interiors, if you close up, you get all of space. OK, is, that, is it clear what I mean by a packing? Um, now, this, as stated, is completely without a theory, right? You just start randomly sticking in spheres wherever you want until you filled up space. So we need some structure. And the structure will be the one that is enjoyed by the Apollonian packing, which we call crystallographic. So a packing is crystallographic if it arises as the limit set of some geometrically finite reflection group. So let me explain what this is a mouthful. Let me explain what this means with a single picture. So um, let's, let's start again. Don't go yet. Back up, back up. OK. So, so here is, and the, the, so if you have a gr subgroup of isometries of hyperbolic n plus 1 space, its limit set will be in Rn, union infinity. That's the set of its limit points. And reflection group means it's generated by reflection. So if you have a hyperplane, the reflection is just the Euclidean reflection. Or you can have a hyperplane, which is really a geodesic half sphere. And then the um, reflection is inversion through that half sphere. OK? Does everybody know what I, what I OK? So um, and geometrically finite is a slightly technical condition, but it's basically the only thing that people like to work with in hyperbolic groups in large dimension and um, that are thin. So um, if you really want, I'll give you the definition, but maybe I can just show you what's going on. So here's a collection of walls. So here's the example. So I take this wall, and this is its, its boundary at, at infinity. And here's this second wall. And then there's a third wall orthogonal to them. And then there's this circle here. And we're just going to take some point in upper half uh, three space, an upper three space, and start moving it around. By, the, by this action. So if I take a single, so which one did we do? I, th I think it moved across one of these walls, maybe this wall. Everybody see that? Just re got reflected there. And then again, so that time it looked like it got sent out of the sphere. And then it got sent back this way. OK, so, so you see what's going on. So now let me play the movie. No, you don't see what's going on? Good question? Somebody said no? I didn't see you didn't see anything. I tried to points. You're just noticing points, right? So I'm taking points, and, I, and wherever that point is in space, I'm going to just randomly take a sequence of these and move it by that. Oh, there are small dots there. There are small dots. You see the small <laughs> dots? Yes. It's very important to see the small dots. OK? So it's clear what's going on each time. I'm just moving it through one of these walls. and. Most of the time, well, th three of the four generators are just Euclidean reflections, and then one of them sends it inside that sphere. And let's see what happens when we let it go for a long time. Not too long. So it's developing a limit set at the boundary. The boundary is the floor. And I hope you are convinced that this limit set is an Apollonian circle packing with 
these lines and these circles and so on. Okay, so that's the crystallographic condition. So we'll say a packing is crystallographic if its limit set is the same as the limit set of some geometrically finite reflection group. Yes? Why crystallographic? It's the, the reflections are a crystallographic condition. Actually, it'll be much more related to just the reflections. I mean, this is the terminology for reflection groups in hyperbolic space. Okay. okay? All right, so what is the main infinitude theorem? The known examples, these, the set of finite list that, that people knew before is the, just the tip of the iceberg. So there are infinitely many conformally and equivalent integral crystallographic packings. That's the first theorem. So let me try to explain where that's coming from. So here's an example of one that you will not find in the literature, just some random looking guy. Um, it might, if I just give you an example like this, uh, it might not be so easy to realize it as the limit set of some geometrically finite reflection group. But trust me, uh, one can. Um, so to explain the proof of this, let me give a little bit more notation. So I'll refer to, uh, given a packing that's crystallographic, I'll say a symmetry group of it is some geometrically finite reflection group whose limit set is that packing. Okay, so in the case of the Apollonian packing, so here's the Apollonian packing, you can take the symmetry group to be this, exactly this set of walls that we saw in the previous picture. And it's not unique. Um, any normal subgroup will have the same limit set. OK, so given a packing and its symmetry group, we will define the supergroup to be the group generated by the symmetry group together with reflections through all the spheres in the packing itself. OK, so in the case of the Apollonian packing, I have to add one more wall, which is one of the walls from the packing itself, and that'll give me the supergroup. And so the fundamental domain of that action is now this familiar picture looks like the Picard group. OK, is that, is that definition clear? Yes? Is it clear that for all examples in the literature, you can find a, a crystallographic group like this? It's not clear, but it's a fact. OK. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's true that they all have satisfied this. All the known ones, yeah. Other questions? So the supergroup, you take the group generated by the original symmetry group, and you throw in reflections through all the spheres in the packing itself. So the packing is also made up of spheres. Yeah, hem, yeah, exactly. The spheres are the boundary of some geodesic half, half uh, disks, half planes. So those reflections will now give you a, a group of isometries in hyperbolic one higher dimension. Okay. Um, and then I want to define the super packing of a packing is the orbit of the packing under this supergroup. So in the case of the Apollonian packing, maybe it's easier to, to see if I just draw it. Let's see. I know that side has a bad angle. Is this side OK? So here's the Apollonian packing. You start drawing all of these circles. And it has this symmetry group. I guess I drew it like this. And one more here. OK, so that's the symmetry group. But now you're allowed to reflect through the spheres in the packing themselves. So I can reflect um, this sphere through this one. I get this, and this, and this, and, and, and so on. So it's not a packing any longer. It's just you keep reflecting through the spheres, including the spheres in the packing. OK, so that's called the super packing. So it's not a packing. It's, a, it's now going to be dense. OK. And the final definition is, if every sphere in the super packing has integer bend, then we call the packing super integral. Not just integral, but super integral. So not only are the original spheres all integral, but the ones that you get from reflections through those spheres are themselves also integral. Does that make sense? OK, and then so um, theorem Two is that actually you cannot make infinitely many not just integral but super integral crystallographic packings. Okay. Any questions? So let me try to explain how we do this. So this uh, will I'll I'll do the two-dimensional version although we can do it in some some other dimensions. Um, so in two dimensions you can do this from polyhedral circle packings. So let me remind you this uh, beautiful theorem. I guess goes back to work of Kobe, but it's Kobe Andreev Thurston 
And uh, the proof for what I'm going to say uh, is really from due to Schramm. So it says that if you give me a combinatorial type of a convexly realizable polyhedron, then there, there is some, there's some geometrization of it that has a mid-sphere. So a mid-sphere is a sphere which is tangent to all the edges. Let me give you an example that, that explains this definition, this theorem. So if you take the cube octahedron, so let me remind you, you take a cube, you start chopping off the corners until the corners meet at a point. That's the cube octahedron. Okay, so, the, so as a combinatorial poly, polyhedron, it just means I have the vert vertex data and the tangency data. So every vertex should be tangent to a triangle, a square, a triangle, and a square as you go around any vertex. And it's vertex transitive, so all the vertices are the same. Okay? Given that, poly that combinatorial data, there's a way to stretch the vertices in Euclidean space so that there exists a sphere which is tangent to every face, uh, it's tangent to every edge. Okay? Is the statement clear? What's, what's KAT? What's that? A KAT is Kobe and Jeff Thurston. Kobe and Jeff Thurston. Yeah. Okay? So that's what this theorem says. And I claim this, is, this can be used to attach a packing to your favorite combinatorial type of a polyhedron. Okay, is the theorem okay? Is everyone, is everyone clear what this is? So here's the proof. Um, once you geometrize your polyhedron, that mid-sphere is also the mid-sphere of the dual. So here's the dual polyhedron. In the case of the cube octahedron, it's a uh, rhombic dodecahedron. And um, so you just cone all of the cone off, off the, the circles, and that gives you where the vertices of the dual need to be. And once you have that, um, what you get is a pair of clusters. So your cluster just means finite collection of spheres. So there's a cluster whose tangency graph is isomorphic to the nerve of this cluster will be exactly your original polyhedron. And there's an orthogonal co-cluster whose nerve is the dual polyhedron. So here's the, so after stereographic projection to the plane, this is the configuration. So I claim, so each vertex here corresponds to a circle. So this vertex is this circle, say. It's vertex transitive, so it doesn't matter which one I pick. And next to every vertex, I need to see a triangle, square, triangle, square. So here's a triangle. And there's a square, and here's a triangle, and there's a square. And now you're back to, and that's the data at each circle. Is that clear? OK, so at any, around any circle is this triangle, square, triangle, square. And there's an orthogonal co-cluster, which has tangency graph the rhombic dodecahedron. Does that make sense? So are you happy with the blue cluster? Then the red cluster has tangency graphs. So every vertex here has a square, a combinatorial square, has three squares around it. So every vertex here has a square, then a square, then a square, three squares. One, two, three. Good. I didn't find another one I wasn't supposed to. OK? And it's orthogonal. It meets, whenever it meets, it meets at right angles. So that's the orthogonal co-cluster condition. OK? And now what do you do? You let gamma be the group generated by reflections in one higher dimension through the walls bounded by the co-cluster. And you let that act on the cluster. And you will get a crystallographic packing. And we will say that it's modeled on this polyhedron. So here's the case of the cube octahedron. OK? So, um, just remember this 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 6, 6 picture. That's all I want you to remember for now. OK, and then so we'll define a polyhedron to be integral or super integral if there exists some packing modeled on it by this construction, which is integral or super integral. Does that make sense? And so the question is, which polyhedra are integral or, or super integral? So uh, let's understand this question. You hand me your favorite combinatorial type of a polyhedron and say, tell me what the answer is. It's not exactly trivial. So first of all, Kobe and Dreyf Thurston is an existence proof. So there's an infinite limiting process. If you actually want to do this geometrization, there's an infinite limiting process that in the end will get you the, the geometrization. Um, but how do I know if 3.99 is actually going to get over to 4 or not. Okay. 
So um, what saves you is MOSDA rigidity, which uh, has a consequence that you can make all of the bends and the centers algebraic. And so once you have 100 decimal places, you just tell the computer um, what algebraic number is near there. And once you have a bunch of algebraic numbers, you rigorously verify that the tangency data is what you needed it to be. And then you stop. Okay? Then that tells you if 3.99 really is 4. Okay? So you can do this, although so I don't have any way to control. You know, When I say guess the algebraic values, that, that assumes that the number field is not too crazy. I don't have any way of controlling a priori the degree of the extension in terms of the complexity of the polyhedron. So that's something that's completely not known to me, and I think in general. Um, OK, so once you have these, uh, so, so here's what we, can, what we can prove. First of all, we can prove that uh, infinitely many polyhedra are indeed integral but that, and super integral. But that's for a stupid reason. That's because uh, infinitely many polyhedra give rise to exactly the same circle packing. OK, so that's cheating. In other words, you'll see the Apollonian circle packing as the uh, packing modeled on the tetrahedron. And you also see it modeled on a million, in fact, infinitely many other polyhedra will, will arise. And um, they give you the same packing. Less trivial is that, in fact, they're infinitely many conformally in equivalent superintegral polyhedral packings. Okay, so you get uh, conformally in equivalent packings and infinitely many arising this way. Uh, and that implies our theorem, too, that there are indeed infinitely many of these guys. So here, that's where this example comes from. It's, it's from taking some very complicated polyhedron that we can prove is going to be superintegral and um, showing you the packing. OK, any questions on this? I'm going to say more about the, the proof now. But is the statement clear? OK. So, uh, so the proof is in two stages. Stage one is to find some seed polyhedra. And stage two is to give some operations, what we call growths, on the polyhedra that give, that give rise to new polyhedra that you can control something about this integrality or superintegrality. Um, in stage one, we say, well, what's kind of the class of polyhedra that we're going to try to do this Kobe and Dreyf Thurston to and understand whether or not you get integrality? We chose the uniform polyhedra because they had a lot of symmetries, and we're hoping that arithmetic has a lot of symmetries, so somehow the two should be uh, linked together. So the uniform polyhedra are those that have regular polygons as faces, and they're vertex transitive, like the cube octahedron. And these fall into um, three categories, the platonic, the Archimedean, solids. And so these are finite lists, and the prisms are an and antiprisms are infinite lists. So a prism is you take an n-gon on top and the same one on bottom, and then you just connect squares between. And an antiprism, you take the same thing and you snub it by half the angle, and then you put triangles in between. Okay. So among the platonic solids, the tetrahedron, which gives you the Apollonian circle packing, the octahedron, which gives that void packing that, we, that, that was known in the 70s, and the cube is the dual of the octahedron. That'll also be integral. In the Archimedean solids, we saw the cube octahedron is integral. Two more are also integral. And for the prisms and antiprisms, the three, four, and six prisms and the three antiprisms are all integral. And these are the only ones. So some of this is cheating. A four prism is a square on top and bottom connected by squares. So that's a cube we already, that's on the list. Three antiprism is take a triangle and snub it and connect. That's an octahedron. So that's also cheating. The three prism is very interesting, and I'm going to talk about it in a second. The most interesting, though, is the six prism. It's the only one on this list which is integral but not superintegral. And this is the first time that we know of a crystallographic packing which can be integral but not superintegral. All of the other known examples were both integral and superintegral. I'll explain the significance of that in a minute. OK, so uh, stage two is the growth, and you see that by studying the three prism. So what is a three prism? It's the gluing of two tetrahedra along a vertex. So let me draw this picture. OK, so here's one tetrahedron geometrized. And here's another tetrahedron geometrized. OK, so let me draw these as tetrahedra meaning the tangency data. So the tangency data is just every, there are four points, and every point is tangent to the other three. OK, so here's another tetrahedron on top and on bottom. 
The three prism is a gluing of two tetrahedra along a vertex. I remove this vertex on top and on bottom. I will remove this vertex on top and on bottom. And I glue them together along the corresponding edges. So I glue this into here. And that's the data of a three prism. OK? And you can make a packing built on that, which will be integral as we claimed. So um, you get new packings from old by this gluing construction. And there so we, we, we find, define six families of operations, three on the vertices and three on the faces, which are the same uh, after duality. The operations are doubling along vertices, doubling along faces, uh, gluing a seed. So if I take something, I could glue, instead of doubling, I could glue another tetrahedron into here. I could do some other, there, there are some operations. It doesn't really matter what they are, but there are series of operations that when you do after a while, you get pictures like this. So that's where this picture came from, it came from a bunch of iterations of these processes. And the key observation is that when you do these gluings, the polyhedron modeled on the growth is completely, uh, you know, looks really different from the original one. They're com conformally an equivalent. But the superpacking of the growth is a subset of the superpacking of the seed. And so if the superpacking of the seed had all integer bends, it doesn't matter how complicated the packing of the, the, this growth is, the superpacking will still only have integer circles, integer curvatures, bends, and hence will be integral. So we get the integrality from the superintegrality together with these operations. OK? So this is, um, this is why superintegrality is the key condition. Integrality does not guarantee if you're only integral, you start doing these operations, you can get non-integral packings out of, the, out of this. OK, so that's the proof of the, of the infinitude theorem. Any, any questions on how this works? Yes? Six prism also obtained by gluing? The six prism is obtained by gluing a hexagonal pyramid uh, onto another hexagonal pyramid in the same way. And I'll, and I'll come back to that. Yeah, but hexagonal pyramid is, is it a member of the other list above? It's not a uniform polyhedron. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't talk about it yet, but I will. Other questions? OK. So um, now the finiteness theorem. I promised you two things. One, one is there are infinitely many of these things. The other is there are finitely many of these things. So um, here's the first finiteness theorem. These packings, I only showed you circle packings. You guys didn't complain. Well, I'm not going to show you 1,000 dimensional packings. They don't exist. These crystallographic packings only exist in relatively small dimension. Uh, 1,000. Actually, it's, it's even less than that. Well, if you, ins if you insist on integrality. I'll say that in a second. So, no integrality assumptions. Just crystallographic packings themselves can only exist in, finitely, in finite dimensions. No, it's very not tight. I think the highest that's known is 21. <laughs> yeah. OK. So um, this theorem will be an easy corollary of a structure theorem. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you the whole structure theorem, but one consequence of it is that this supergroup, the group generated by not just the reflection, the symmetry group, but also reflections through all the spheres, is a lattice. Well, that shouldn't be surprising from, from the picture, but it takes some, some work to prove. A lattice meaning a discrete reflection, uh, well, it happens to be a reflection group, but a discrete group of finite covolume. And there's a beautiful old theorem of Vinberg in the co-compact case and Prokhorov in the non-uniform case that re hyperbolic reflection groups only exist in these dimensions. So these crystallographic packings have to come from hyperbolic reflection groups, and there's a finite dimension on where they come. Just a uh, naive question. Just having a dense limit set is not enough yet. Having a dense limit set and not the reflection, not generated by reflections? So a group just having a dense limit set does not imply that it is uh, That it's a lattice, no. It, 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 it does not imply that it's a lattice, yeah. yeah. Already in dimension two, there are lots of examples. If it's geometrically finite, then, then it, so yeah, it, it depends on if you want to assume geometric finiteness in that. 
The counterexamples I know to, to your question are not geometrically finite. OK, so, uh, so that's, that's where this comes from. And the main theorem is that there are finitely many of these superintegral crystallographic packings up to commensurability of the supergroups. So you take this, these supergroups, or these lattices, and there will only be finitely many of them. So in this infinite list before, the supergroups were just all commensurate to a finite list. And this is in all dimensions. Well, of course, if there's finitely many in each dimension, the dimensions are bounded. Right? Um, and that's itself an easy corollary of, right, so theorem is that uh, with a little t and, and, and uh, quotes, is uh, we're still writing this up. So hopefully our, what we have in mind as a proof will we'll go through. Um, and this is a consequence of the theorem that if you have a crystallographic packing, which is super integral, this key condition that I keep insisting on, then its supergroup, which is a lattice, is not just some lattice, it's an arithmetic lattice. That's it. These superintegral ones have to come from arithmetic groups. And uh, actually, uh, th thanks to a conversation with Akshay that I don't know if you remember, that uh, we think we can, we can prove this. He gave a big hint. Um, and so this, uh, together with the following theorem, that there are only finitely many maximal arithmetic hyperbolic reflection groups in all dimensions, tells you that there are only finitely many superintegral crystallographic packings. So um, this goes in dimension two. This is work of Long, McLaughlin, Reed, and then Agel, and Agel, Bill, Lipetsky, Storm, White. Uh, from another point of view in, of uh, Nikulin, tells you that there are finitely many. And Vinberg proved long ago that the dimension of uh, arithmetic reflection groups is bounded by 30. So if you don't like dimension bounded by 1,000, now the dimension is bounded by, by 30. I mean, once you're in 10 space, what, what difference does it make to 1,000 space? OK, any questions on the, uh, the finiteness theorem? So let me say a little bit more about it. OK, so the main, the main thing I want to focus on is if a crystallographic packing is superintegral, then its supergroup is arithmetic. So um, superintegrality is necessary. This six prism, or rather the hexagonal pyramid, which will give you the same uh, issue is integral but not superintegral, and its supergroup is not arithmetic. Okay, so superintegrality is definitely, and I'll say more about that later. It's definitely necessary. Um, a natural question you might ask: Okay, so there's this finite list. To what extent is there a converse? In other words, if you hand me an arithmetic reflection group, can I find a crystallographic packing inside of it? In other words, is there a crystallographic packing which is superintegral and its supergroup is commensurate to this arithmetic reflection group you handed me? So we can prove in dimension 2 over q that, yes, the answer is, is you can always do this. In other words, every reflective Bianchi group supports a superintegral crystallographic packing. On the other hand, what and is not uniform? so, uh, so non-uniform means has cusps, has uh, parabolic elements. Yeah. So the converse holds for non-uniform lattices in dimension two. And in fact, every previously known circle packing that was integral arises in, in this way. So there were a couple more that I, that I didn't show you, but they all come from this. And, and more uh, new ones that hadn't been observed before come from this. Um, on the other hand, if you give me a co-compact arithmetic lattice, I don't know how to do this in general. So I, in fact, I don't know of a single integral, not even super integral, just integral packing, whose supergroup is co-compact. Um, I can construct not integers, but uh, golden mean integers, for example, superintegral packings uh, on the right angle of the decahedron, just to give you one explicit example of a group which is arithmetic and co-compact. OK? So um, this I, I, I would be very interested to understand better. Let me try to explain what, what this theorem is doing. So any questions on the statement of the theorem? Arithmetic, not necessarily congruence. Yeah, not necessarily congruence. But I only care about up to commensurability, so. Yeah. Congruence will be an issue uh, later. Sometimes I need congruence for other things. I'll say that in a minute. OK, so let me try to explain this. So every reflective Bianchi group, so what's a reflective? So the Bianchi groups are SL2 of some quadratic, imaginary quadratic ring of integers. We saw in Akshay's talk. Um, reflective means it's commensurate to a reflection group. 
And uh, the list is com it's completely classified. So the f I mean, Bianchi started this the whole <laughs> classification. Um, and we knew what the list was, but then we didn't know if there might be other examples. And finally, Bill Lepetsky and McLeod showed, proved that, no, there are no, these are the only ones, period. So there's a complete classification. There's 17 of them or something. And these are the only uh, M's for which SL2OM is reflective. And so let's look at a particular example to see where this, how, do, how you find these super integral packings. So let's look at M equals 6. So here's what you get in the literature. You get a Coxeter diagram. So what this Coxeter diagram means, and I've, I've given you, again, how each vertex corresponds to a wall. So the vertex 1 is this wall 1. And vertex 2 is this wall 2. And these two walls are parallel. In other words, the vertices, these, these walls meet at a cusp. So the dihedral angle at which they meet is 0. And that's uh, shown in the Coxeter diagram by a thick line. If there's no line, no line means the two walls are orthogonal. So 1 and 3 should be orthogonal. 3 is the vertical wall. 1 is the horizontal wall. They're orthogonal. Um, 6 and 2 meet at two lines. If there are m minus 2 thin lines, then the walls intersect the dihedral angle pi over m. So if there are two lines, then m is 4. So 6 and 2, that's this angle here, is pi over 4. And so on. So, so this data will, will determine this set of walls. OK? Is that, is that clear? And if there's a dotted line, that means so 3 and 6 have a dotted line between them, then the walls are disjoint. So 3, um, they're oriented walls, by the way. So the orientation of 3 is that way. The interior of 6 is this way. So these two are disjoint. And so there's a dotted line between them. That's basically all you need to know to, to follow the rest. OK, is this, is this clear? This Coxeter data. So this is the Coxeter data. And here's a little bit more of our structure theorem. If you have a reflection group with walls C twiddle that can be decomposed as a cluster co-cluster so that any pair of spheres in the cluster is either disjoint or tangent from each other, or and any wall in the cluster is either disjoint, tangent, or orthogonal to something in the co-cluster, then when you take the orbit of the co-cluster, the, the cluster under the group generated by the co-cluster, you get a crystallographic packing. So let's just look at this. I'm going to take C to be 1. And 1 is, well, the, so this condition is vacuous because there's not a pair. But this condition says 1 is either disjoint, uh, it's not disjoint to anybody, or tangent, yes, it's tangent to 2, or orthogonal. It's orthogonal to everybody else. So it meets everybody else at right angles, right angles, right angles, right angles, right angles, and 2, it's, it's tangent to. That means this, we have such a decomposition. So there should be a crystallographic packing, which is the orbit of this wall under the others. So let's see. First, if I take the image through 2, I get a wall up here. And then if I take the image through 5, I'll get a circle here, and so on. This is the orbit. OK? What is this? 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 6, 6. It's our cube octahedron. So that's what the cube octahedron is. It's this decomposition of the m equals 6 Bianchi group. Yes? Um, just to double check, so the, the sphere 5 and 6 cross um, at a right angle. The sphere is 5 and 6. That looks like a right angle, and they're not connected, so it's a right angle. Yes. Yes. Um, you could have also taken the orbit of 4. You would get a new packing. You could also take the orbit of 3 and 4. 3 and 4 are tangent to each other, are, are uh, disjoint, or are they're tangent to each other, and they're either disjoint or tangent from everybody else, or orthogonal from everybody else. So this is how you just look at Coxeter diagrams and say, there's a packing, there's a packing, there's a packing. OK, is that clear? OK, uh, let me say a little bit more. So here's the structure theorem again. So what Bill Lepesky and McLeod actually give you is the list of Coxeter diagrams and then the information that tells you there aren't any others. So for m equals 11, you can see 3 and 4. In fact, 3 and 4, for lots of these, 3 and 4 will be, uh, will give you super, in will give you crystallographic packings. To know that they're super integral takes a little bit more work. So they're not always super integral when you just arbitrarily choose 
uh, decomposition. But you can, for all of these, choose decompositions. All except one. What's the one case? Of course, there has to be an outlier. There's one outlier. Does anybody see what it is? Where there's no decomposition into a cluster and co-cluster so that you're always either disjoint or tangent from, from the rest. That's good. The Eisenstein integers are always your enemy in so many things. Right, so these are all uh, single lines. Maybe it's, maybe it's hard to tell thick lines from single lines. These are all single lines. So there's no way to take one of them and have it be disjoint from, from the rest so that you can start taking the orbit. If you take the orbit of a single one of them, they, they start overlapping because they meet it at some funny angle. So we played around with this one for a while. And then what we found out is that the data is wrong. So this classification had been done already. I mean, these uh, computations had been done 20 years ago, if not more, 30 years ago. And uh, they're done by uh, applying Vinberg's algorithm. And uh, you start with some wall, and then you, it, Vinberg tells you how to take new walls. And, and if it happens to close up, then you get a lattice and you're done. And if it doesn't close up, then you have some other reason that you need to show that the group must be an infinite group and it's not reflective. <coughs> so um, the caveat is when you do this, you have to make sure that the wall you start with isn't, doesn't have an extra stabilizer. And what everybody had done is taken, there's one wall that works for all the examples, except it doesn't work for the Eisenstein integers because the group of units is just a little bigger than usual. Okay. So the correct uh, Coxeter diagram turns out to be this which still doesn't help us because there's no decomposition of this one. But now if you play with that one, um, you can find a subgroup of this one, which is this one. And now you have, you can take one or, uh, yeah, you can take one or three as crystallographic packings. And that's the theorem. OK, so any questions on that? So this, is, so this will show that, I mean, for all but three, this, this comes just from the structure theorem. And for three, you have to do a little bit more work, including find mistakes in the literature. OK. All right. Um, so what happens for co-compact groups? So in the case of co-compact reflective arithmetic groups in dimension 2 over q, these will, will be the symmetry groups of uh, these two quadratic forms. Sums of three squares minus seven x squared, sums of three squares minus 15 x squared. All the other ones are non reflective. Right? These are the anisotropic ones. So 15 is not a sum of three squares, and neither is seven. And the coxeter. Generated, generated by reflections, yeah. So that the, the full integer uh, symmetry group is commensurate with a reflection group. So the rest of them are non reflective. These are the only reflective ones. And the Coxeter diagrams now are, again, some diagrams where I don't immediately see a decomposition. Here it is for 7. Here it is for 15. Um, and we don't know. We don't know. We've played around for a while. We, it doesn't look like you can construct one, uh, although we don't have a proof. So we don't know what's going on in, in, in the co-compact case. It really helps to have, for this decomposition, it really helps to have tangency, in other words, non-uniformity. OK. Any questions on, on this? So uh, what happens in higher dimensions? So again, this is a theorem with a little t. We're still working on this. But uh, I think we can prove that they exist in every dimension up to n equals 20, which means hyperbolic 21 space. So for example, Vinberg classified the Coxeter diagrams for symmetry groups of this. And they are reflective once you get to hyperbolic 14 space, or n equals 13. And here's the classification. And again, in every case, you just look with your finger. Here's a, here's a crystallographic packing. This, this is orthogonal or tangent to everybody else. And hence, uh, and when you take the orbit of a single sphere, you can always make it super integral from arithmeticity. Um, so you do this for all of these examples. Uh, so you just use the structure theorem and look with your eyes. And we can go up to examples of uh, Borchards in 21 dimensions and but, that, but that's the limit of, of what we know. OK. So let me come back to uh, other questions. Let me come back to your question about the hexagonal, bi uh, hexagonal um, prism, which we can study through the pyramid in the same way. So here it is. So this is the tangency data. Hopefully you see, let's see, uh, this. So what's a hexagonal pyramid, right? It's a, it's just a hexagon and then an, an apex. Well, 
somewhere. That's why I let the computer draw. Um, so we should see one circle that's tangent to all the other ones, and then all the other ones go around in a cycle. So this is the apex, and these go around in a cycle, and there are six of them, and all, they're all tangent to the apex. Okay? And the dual is, again, is also a hexagonal uh, pyramid, where this one is the apex, and then these are in a cycle around. So if you do this operation, you, you can see that it is indeed integral. And um, let me show you why it's not super integral. This is something that doesn't happen for many other um, for many other configurations. So here's why it's not super integral. Um, let's take this configuration. I'll take I'll take this. So uh, the outermost circle will have radius 1, and the innermost circles will have radius a third each. And if you, do, if you take this initial configuration and you start taking the orbit through it, you'll get only integer circles. But now when you start taking the supergroup, that means you're allowed to reflect through the circles themselves. So I'm allowed to reflect all the circles through the outermost circle. And in particular, this circle of radius a third will be reflected to a circle of radius 3. So this will be one of the reflections, right? But a circle of radius 3 has curvature 1 third. Well, OK, let's rescale everything. But no, you're allowed to reflect through this one and, and reflect forever, and you just get more and more denominators. So the denominators 3 are growing. So that's your first hint that there's some non-arithmeticity going on. So it's not super integral, although it is integral. And then, so let's look at the supergroup. Let's determine whether it can be arithmetic or not. So what's the supergroup? Again, it's the group generated by reflections through the cluster and the co-cluster together. And now we need a little bit more information. It's not enough to look just at the Coxeter diagram. Let's take the full Gramian. So the Gramian is the matrix of uh, inversive products, where the product of two circles is cosh of the hyperbolic distance. So if I have two circles on the boundary, then I take the corresponding hemispheres, and there's some hyperbolic distance between them, and cosh of that distance is this inversive product of the two circles, just by definition. And what Binberg shows is that this Gramian will tell you whether the group is arithmetic or not. So the, this lattice, gamma twiddle, is arithmetic if and only if, when you take cyclic products of the twice the Gramian, all you get is the integers. So when you apply Kobe and Dreyf Thurston, here is the Gramian of the hexagonal pyramid. So these numbers, 2 root 3, OK, so let's see what's going on. The number 1 means that the cosh is 1, which means that the distance between them is 0, which means the two circles are tangent. So in the Coxeter diagram, whenever you see 1, you would see a thick line. So these are tangent, these are tangent. This is just the tangency data of the hexagonal pyramid. That's what the 1s here are. And this is the tangency data of the dual, which is also a hexagonal pyramid. The zeros tell you when these uh, spheres meet, at orthog meet orthogonally. So that's where a cluster circle meets a co-cluster circle. That's the, that's the zero data. Everything else, <clears throat> that's the combinatorial data that's fed into Kobe and Dreyf Thurston. And the rest of these are numerically evaluated. And then you guess uh, what algebraic number is nearby. And then you vi rigorously verify that, yes, this is the data that, uh, of, of this Gramian. Okay. So all of these numbers in the Coxeter diagram are just dotted. They're, 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 separa they're measuring separation. But for us, it's important not to know just that there is some separation, but what that separation is explicitly to, to understand arithmeticity. And um, so what you need to do is take cyclic products in twice. There are no halves here, so it's OK. Um, you take cyclic products, take any your favorite list of uh, walls, it start and end at the same wall, and take the transition Take the, the transition matrix and just multiply them all together. If you get an integer at the end, the group is arithmetic. So you see, if you stay inside the cluster, or if you stay inside the co-cluster, you're multiplying integers. If you ever leave the cluster, you have to come back to the co through the co-cluster. So you get the root threes twice. And so again, you get integers, except for one entry. So if I go from vertex 1 to vertex negative 1 and back, I get 4 over 3. 
and 4 thirds is not an integer. So this one entry is the entry that ruins the arithmeticity here. But there are a lot of integers, so it allows you to have integrality, but not super integrality and no arithmeticity. So this is non-arithmetic, and it's similar to the Deline Mostow uh, examples, actually. Because what's going on is you can write this uh, group, this lattice gamma, as uh, so this so G will be some orthogonal group of signature 3, 1. It, you can make it have entries in the integers with some denominators that are uh, a third. But it is, so you should think of this as an S arithmetic group, maybe. So it's, it should be embedded in G of R cross G of the three addicts. But it's already a lattice in the first factor. And so it's thin as a, in its Zariski closure, which is this product. Okay. So, so we found a, a bunch more of these, both by looking at polyhedra and by looking at uh, cutting Bianchi groups in certain ways. And uh, maybe more non-arithmetic groups that are quasi-arithmetic, so they have rational entries, but they're not arithmetic. Maybe they are responsible for integral, but not superintegral packings. I don't know. OK, yes? This picture reminds me of uh, Poncelet here. Is that Poncelet? That if you have two circles, you start with the circle, turn into them, and you go for other circles. Either you uh, touch the last one, or you miss it, no matter with which circle you start. Would that be related to the picture you're working? I'm not sure. Are you referring to the fact that if you have an odd number of uh, points on the boundary, there's always a way to make horror cycles that are tangent in a cycle in a rigid way? Is that the, is that the same? Mm -hmm. uh, if you have two circles, yes. if, uh, if you, uh, if you uh, uh, make an arbitrary circle tangent to both of them and finish the packing, uh -huh. if, you, if, you, if, you're complete, if you're able to complete the packing, it's independent of the placement of the first. Uh -huh. or, or, OK. No, I don't know. I don't know if it's related to this. So I'm, I'm just saying that maybe there is some uh, deformation possible in some of these packings. It's possible to deform part of the packing and still get arithmetic packing. Well, you deform just change, but not continuously, right? No, this, it's rigid. Be well, uh, no, you have Mostar rigid. Rigid. leave the arithmetic and then get into another arithmetic. You have Mostar rigidity, because these are hyperbolic three manifolds and higher. So you have Mostar rigidity. There's no the the, out, the, vert, the entries are all algebraic. Period. Just they're not usually integers. Sometimes they're not they're not integers, but they are rational. And then you see integral, but not superintegral packings. And most of the time, what you get is just you know some some weird high degree algebraic numbers that are not algebraic integers. Yeah. What is this matrix? So this is the Gramian, the Gram matrix of all of the inner products. So when you see ones, that means these two walls are tangent. When you see zeros, that's, uh, that's when they're orthogonal. And uh, in the Coxeter diagram, anything bigger than one would be just a dot, a dotted line. They're, they're disjoint. But we actually need to measure these distances because Vinberg's criterion of arithmeticity is that the cyclic products are, are always integers or half integers. If, if you multiply the gram in by two, then, then the cyclic products are, need to be integers. So if there was a 1 half here, that's a, a pi over 3 angle intersection. OK, do I have one minute left? Um, so let me, since you asked about congruence groups, so there's an issue. Because it, let's recall this local global uh, question that we could solve, well, asymptotically in the um, Apollonian case. By the way, in higher dimensions, so for the Saudi sphere packing, you can prove the full local global uh, conjecture. Um, I did this a couple of years ago. Uh, there are many more points there. So the, the, the hardest cases are the circle packings. And so you have this infinite family of circle packings. You might ask, when can you prove such a theorem? And um, to the extension to the octahedron was done by my student, Xin Zhang, a couple of years ago. And most recently, uh, Fuchs, Stange, and Zhang extended this completely to, um, to prove the asymptotic under a certain condition, which is the condition that we had been using all along. The condition is the orbit of the symmetry group the orbit of some circle under the symmetry group <coughs> will satisfy this asymptotic local global. So you do this one orbit at a time, one, one uh, element of the cluster at a time. It'll satisfy the asymptotic local global if the following holds. There needs to be a circle tangent to the original circle, an auxiliary circle, so that the stabilizer of that auxiliary circle in this group 
is, is, which is a Fuchsian lattice now, is congruence. So here we'll really be using congruence in a, uh, we, need, we need equations. So if, if you want equations, it's not enough to have arithmeticity, you actually need uh, congruence. So this is a general version of uh, an observation of Sarnax for the Apollonian packing. And what we can show is that infinitely many conformally and equivalent polyhedron packings do satisfy this condition, and infinitely many don't. So let me give you an example, or a non-example. Here's one that doesn't satisfy the condition. So this is a circle so that it has three auxiliary circles that you can try, three tangent circles. But the stabilizer in gamma of this circle is this hyperbolic group, which is non-congruence. And the stabilizer of this one is this hyperbolic group, which you can also show is non-congruence. And the stabilizer of this one is this group, which yet again is non-congruence. So you can't prove this local global theorem for the orbit, at least not by these techniques, for the orbit of this circle. So, so there's still much more to be done even, even for circle packings. OK, so let me stop there. Thank you. Oh, thank you.